welcome Ross to the Linnaean Society and thank you very much for delivering this evening's lecture. Um, I wanted to start off by saying, you know, for me, this is very much a, a personal lecture and experience as a, as a gay man and as part of the queer community. Um, I've spent much of my own personal life, you know, being involved in campaigning and activism. And much of the, the last 50 years or so of our community's activism has involved, you know, being on the streets, being in, in the realm of politics and putting our existence and our space into the wider world. Um, and through that process, it's fair to say, I think we have somewhat been lost in the history and annals and activities of the sciences in particular. And there are many other aspects of human activity as well. So it is really, really wonderful, you know, as a member of this community that this is something that we can do at the Linnaean Society, which is talk about and share these important and interesting stories, because they're not only important for us as individuals, but they're important societally for all of us who believe that activism is a valid and important part of our existence. Um, I'm not going to say much more about that, because I suspect we may come back to these themes later on, but just to say, um, Ross's work has um, focused very much on queer identities and queer histories, particularly in the sciences. Um, and he's got a, a wide range of literature, the Owens works, which we no doubt will be talking about quite extensively, and also about sex lives of cockroaches. Not, oh, excuse me, not cockroaches, cockchafer beetles, naughty me. Um, and so I'm sure this is going to be a deeply, <laughs> got the giggles now, deeply delightful talk. And thank you very much, Ross, and I'll hand over to you. And we'll be taking questions later on. So please put your questions into the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, thank you, Padma, and uh, a very special thank you to Martin Christian, who's... Hey, Ross. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm good. Uh, but yeah, very special thanks to Martin Christian, who's the editor of the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. Um, last year, we, we published um, an article on, on a queer reading of Darwin on the 150th anniversary of the, the publication of The Descent of Man. And the, the article has had such an amazing reaction. Um, I still get really positive emails about it saying how much it opened up something, a subject which, as Mark has previously indicated, has only in relatively recently um, uh, people been thinking, really, scientists and historians such as myself. And so it really is wonderful to have this opportunity to really push the points and to really broaden up again um, the scope of, of, of um, uh, queer history of science, queer history of biology, queer history of zoology, which is very much what I want to do with this event, to really stress the, the depth and breadth of this history and to underscore the points that it is really very important um, it is not something that is peripheral, um, not something that, that, that um, is, is a minority concern. Um, but for centuries, narratives around the variations of sex, um, intersexualities, uh, transformations of sex, same-sex sexual behaviours, they have, even, if, even when those narratives have um, denied occurrences, even then they have been immensely important in shaping vast arenas of human endeavour. Uh, uh, theological narratives, uh, scientific narratives, also a more broad cultural understanding, particularly in terms of the way that animal behaviour is represented popularly um, in, in natural history programmes and in, in, in popular books. Obviously, if I'm taking this broad approach, I've, I've had to make choices. Um, much detail uh, will necessarily um, uh, be lost for now um, in my more detailed work there is more detail. But in seeking to put some broad brush strokes, um, there is undoubtedly room for a more concerted, um, integrated approach which looks beyond queer and takes in all sex differences, um, sex psychologies, sexual behaviours and humans and non-humans. Um, but we really are playing catch-up 
um, in terms of looking at the, the, the queerer dimensions of the history of zoology. This word queer, I actually tend to use it quite lightly. I, I tend to put it in, in, in the titles of, of my work just to indicate the broad ballpark in which I'm, I'm, I'm working. Um, it's, I, I was a slow convert. I'm, I'm, I'm not young. I well remember the times when queer was used as, 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 a, as a, it was weaponized against queer people um, such as myself. But the new generation have absolutely transformed not just the use of the word, but also what it relates to in terms of um, experiences of queer people and the way that uh, sex differences and sexualities and sexual behaviours are considered. Queer is so useful for scientists, for historians, and for its inclusivity. It doesn't just relate to gay and lesbian, which are the terms that I, I grew up with, or trans. Um, but particularly in the historical contexts when certain uh, sexual erotic thoughts, feelings, um, uh, subjectivities, identities uh, were barely articulated. Um, the, uh, a queer way of thinking um, really is extremely useful. Uh, I'm absolutely, Beyond words, this has been a transformation that's happened in my lifetime. Um, when I was growing up gay in the 1970s and 80s, science was something that was weaponized against me and other queer people. Um, but we are currently living through the most profound changes. Um, and the, like I said, the, the, the current generation have come up with new terms, new words that have challenged um, uh, older, um, pernicious ways of thinking. Um, and nowhere is this more apparent than, than what is going on absolutely now in this moment in, within the sciences. Um, new platforms, new voices coming through, um, allowing um, LGBTQ plus scientists um, uh, a, a voice, voices perhaps that have never come through before. Also more, oh well, yes, in my last slide, I forgot um, to include um, the, the, the name society, absolutely, um, you know, riding the wave of this, um, there's a relatively new uh, web page, LGBT plus at the Linnaean Society, um, which does exactly what I've just expressed. It has given voice to um, various people associated with the, with the Linnaean Society um, and really interesting read um, their experiences. I, I, I wholeheartedly urge you to, to have a look at that. But also more popularly beyond science, um, there are new narratives um, about uh, uh, non-human animal sexual behaviours, absolutely being driven by the museum sector. There have now been several um, innovative uh, natural history museum. Um, uh, I'm going to post a few more. Okay, a few more links. I think that comes through to you. Um, really worth um, having a look at some of this material. It's not unproblematic. Um, uh, heavy doses of anthropomorphism, especially in some of the more popular news reports. But on the other hand, it is also very, very useful for inspiring young people, inspiring students, and I speak from experience, um, of, uh, of thinking more queerly about science and the history of science. Um, it is, of course, important to recognise that there's also a very strong uh, scholarly foundation um, now that, that, again, this has happened relatively recently, um, all kinds of very interesting projects. Um, I'm not a zoologist. I'm not trying to sell anyone any particular idea or theory about uh, sexual behaviours in, in, in uh, non-human animals or, or humans. Uh, such, such things are three a penny these days. Um, there's some amazing projects going on right now and some amazing works. Again, uh, some of these very inspiring, um, particularly I would say biological exuberance um, and evolution's rainbow. Um, absolutely amazing for uh, transforming the way in which scientists today consider sex differences, um, uh, transformations of sex and non-reproductive sexual behaviours. So I'm very keen that as this is happening, that um, historical narratives, the way we think about the history of science, um, keeps up, basically. Um, there are numerous references to sex transformative and intersex um, non-human animals in the classical corpus. Um, I'm going to probably 
changed from my use of the word intersex to hermaphrodite. It's not a word that's kept its, its, um, it, it, its old connotations, but thinking historically, the word was, was hermaphrodite that was used um, in terms of thinking of, of dual sex anatomies. And there's quite a lot of it in, in the classical corpus. Um, but these often occupy a very nebulous uh, position between observation and superstition. Several non-human dual sexed or sex transformative animals were associated with classical mythology. Various animals, for example, among them the mouse, mole, badger, hyena, snake and shrew, were associated with the myth of Tiresias, the blind diviner who changed sex when he struck two mating snakes with his star. Perpetuating a falsehood that would endure for centuries, the first century CE Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder also wrote that hares were hermaphroditic and that they could reproduce equally well without a male. Another enduring zoological misnomer held that the hyena was hermaphrodite, a situation that most likely originated with partial observations of the extended clitoris of the female spotted hyenas. Offering an astute description of dual sex creatures in his History of Animals, Aristotle, writing in the fourth century BCE, noted that three varieties of Serenus um, appeared to be naturally hermaphrodite, reproducing without males. Um, this is particularly insightful. Um, other, other references to, to these fish being hermaphrodite can be found elsewhere in ancient texts. Um, but oddly, given its incisiveness, the observation was largely overlooked for centuries. Most surviving references to dual sex animals in the classical corpus concern mammals in which hermaphroditic anatomies in individuals were considered as unusual for their species. In his histories, written in uh, around 430 BCE, the Greek historian Herodotus stated that when Xerxes was in Sardis, a mule gave birth to a foal um, with male and female genital organs, the male above the other, he wrote. Reflecting a mindset that was common in the classical world, the, occur the occurrence was taken to be a sign of divine wrath. In Generation of Animals, Aristotle mentioned that certain goats were born with both female and male organs of generation, um, eschewing a, a kind of a, a superstitious um, interpretation. He included such occurrences among instances where too much or too little of the generative substance caused bodily parts to be missing too numerous or in the wrong place. In addition to these assorted references to occurrences of individual animals with unusual genital anatomies, there are various references in the classical corpus to other individuals, non-human and human, with different kinds of sex variant anatomies. The phenomenon of avian sex transformation, or more commonly uh, today called reversal, was recognized and discussed. As is well known now, uh, individual birds of many sexually dimorphic species can develop sex characteristics more familiar in the opposite sex. Such natural transformations are uncommon, but not so much so that anyone familiar with, with birds um, on a regular basis, uh, country dwellers, hunters, farmers, gamekeepers, ornithologists and other naturalists, uh, could be un unaware of such occurrences. Through the centuries, sex, sex transformative birds proved to be uh, especially useful scientific subjects, providing key insights into puzzling sex-related phenomena and allowing naturalists to discuss scientifically interesting but socially taboo subjects, such as the mutability of sex differences and same-sex sexual behaviors with relative impunity. Aristotle, for example, bequeathed a strikingly concise and astute description of avian sex transformation, female to male, as well as male to female, that includes a reference to same-sex sexual behaviours. Interestingly, he implied that such behaviours were, in some circumstances, closely associated with the dominant behaviours of the birds. Other classical references to avian sex transformation in various invariably conflated with ancient folklore and religious superstition and equated with human sex variants, demonstrate long-standing familiarity with both male to female and female to male changes of sex in certain individual birds. And through the centuries, uh, specifically uh, masculinized female birds have often been interpreted as, as evil omens and, and killed. 
in contrast to this abundance of references to, to intersexualities and, and transformations of sex in non-human animals, a few references to same-sex sexual behavior um, in non-human animals can be found in the classical corpus, but only a few. Elsewhere in history of animals, Aristotle related that pigeon hens mount each other if no male is present. This prompting them to lay more eggs, so-called wind eggs, than if they had been impregnated. Later in the work, Aristotle further described same-sex sexual behaviours among male partridges and also among quails. As with his description of sex transformative hens, he again implicitly indicates that such behaviours could be closely related to the dominant behaviours of these birds. For example, he noted that during a particular season of the year, male birds defeated in battle were trodden by the victors. He also described how domestic cocks presented uh, to temples as offerings without females were apt to tread newcomers. And he says, as is understandable. Well, other texts echoed Aristotle's descriptions, um, but strangely, given it's, it's, that their astuteness, again, it was, it was not until the 20th century that naturalists uh, more fully considered associations between sexual behaviours and the maintenance of dominance hierarchies. The classical Greeks, however, had an intrinsic understanding of the matter which permeated their society. A cock was used to represent erotic relationships between males, especially a pederastic relationship between a man and a youth in a variety of ways. The bird representing not just homoerotic feelings, but also the differential power dynamics of male-male Greek pederasty. So again, it's that broad cultural reach that even um, quite specialist um, observations um, often have a much broader cultural impact. And, and, and that theme is there from, from the very um, uh, earliest times. Experiences of sexual behaviors in non-human animals clearly varied enormously across temporal, regional, gender, and class differences. Having the authority to publicly propagate assertions about the subject was a rare, elite, and indefatigably patriarchal pastime. For every reference to same-sex sexual behavior in non-human animals that can be found prior to the 19th century, more can be found where an author denies that animals would ever engage in such behaviors. The assertion invariably being made in close association with moral lessons about human sexual relations. Having in earlier texts been relatively tolerant of sexual relationships between males, Plato, for example, expressed the notion that wild animals did not engage in same-sex sexual behaviours, and that such behaviours might therefore reasonably be deemed unnatural. Such notions uh, passed very smoothly into, into Christian theology. So just to offer one example, um, proffering a, a, a similar moral lesson to, to Plato, um, in his edict against same-sex sexual behaviours in humans, uh, the prevalence of which he blamed for an earthquake that damaged Constantinople in, in 557, the Roman Emperor Justinian I decreed that all should hold fear fast to the fear of God and refrain from such an impious and unholy practice, one not to be found committed even among unreasoning creatures. I'm going to leap horrendously through the centuries. Um, such ideas, um, and the, the terminology we have, such as um, um, unnatural against nature, stem from this very, very early formulation of, of natural law, um, which uh, relied very heavily on, on, on this idea of non-occurrence. Um, so I want to start looking at how that changed. I mean, such ideas maintained um, hegemony uh, for, for many centuries. Um, but the early Modern naturalists very, very slowly, very steadily um, introduced some interesting innovations um, into this uh, zoological literature inherited from the classical corpus. Um, a hugely important moment um, comes with the discovery, somewhat belated. Um, it surprised me that, that nobody mentioned this um, prior to 1660, but nobody did. Um, of the, uh, the, the natural hermaphroditism of snails and slugs. Um, in this critical regard, um, this would have profound repercussions for how sex differences um, were considered um, as evolutionary theory developed through the 18th and 19th centuries. 
The observations of the English naturalist John Ray were pivotal. In his first publication, an annotated list of the plants of Cambridgeshire, Ray briefly digressed to discuss what he had observed hidden under some deadly nightshade. Not even this lethal plant escapes the teeth of terrestrial snails and slugs, he wrote. But in early spring, even its leaves are nibbled by these same creatures. Incidentally, concerning these little animals, it may be appropriate to explain that individual ones of them share equally in both sexes and that they are androgynous. For they are both active and passive in turn, impregnating and at the same time being impregnated, as will be sufficiently agreed by anyone who has separated them while they are mating in spring. Even though neither Aristotle nor other authors on nature, as far as we know, have made any mention of the matter. As I said, I mean, Aristotle had, has recognized that certain species of, of fish, the, the, the groupers were, were hermaphrodites, um, but, but that knowledge had, had pretty much been lost by the time Ray was um, uh, writing. And the discovery that certain um, animals, species, um, all, all the individuals of the species um, were naturally dual sexed um, was incredibly, um, uh, I'd like to say revolutionary, but it was a slow burner. Um, the, the issue being, that as the first evolutionists um, began to think in terms of higher and lower animals and that the higher animals had evolved from the lower animals, the question that certain lower animals were naturally hermaphrodite raised the question about the origins of sex. And so the, 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 this observation of rays and, and ones that followed it about other uh, dual sexed creatures um, entailed that from the outset, um, from, the, from the outset, uh, modern evolutionary theory was, was um, had a central concern for the variations of sex. In this regard, in terms of the shaping of very first um, uh, ideas about the, the, the origins of sex differences, sex transformative uh, birds uh, continue to be an important modus operandi of, of, of um, 18th and 19th century biologists. Um, in particular, um, a seminal paper titled An Account of an Extraordinary Pheasant by the Scottish surgeon and naturalist John Hunter, which was published in the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions in 1780. In the paper, Hunter described various examples of wild hen pheasants with male typical plumage. He also described a pea hen with a full-sized eye feathered tail, which was preserved in the collection at Ashton Lever's famous museum in Leicester Square. In life, the bird had astonished its doting owner, Lady Tint, um, by molting and assuming male typical plumage aged around 11 years. Hunter ascribed the phenomenon to the process of aging. We find something similar taking place even in the human species, he wrote. Um, again, um, uh, thinking of, of, of that kind of comparative anatomy, very, very important for the early um, evolutionists. Hunter's study made two innovations um, that would shape modern medical scientific approaches to sex differences, as well as the emerging discipline of teratology and the development of evolutionary theory. The first is the assertion that irregularities, which he called monstrosities, that were observable in anatomical structures throughout the natural world, develop in relation to the fundamental principles which governed the growth of individuals according to the particular pattern of their species. We might now call that a, a, a genetic blueprint. Um, but of course, this is, this is a very, pretty revolutionary thought for 1780, um, in an age that was still largely credulous. Um, Hunter is suggesting that mon so-called monstrosities uh, were not omens or, en or anything to do with divine wrath, um, but actually had natural anatomical origins. The second important innovation in Hunter's paper on avian sex transformation, a foundation stone of Charles Darwin's theory of sexual selection, is his designation of secondary properties, i.e. secondary sexual characteristics, to account for non-genital sex differences in those species uh, which usually have two distinct sexes. The possibility that such differences could, in and of themselves, be collectively considered important objects of scientific study and a means of better understanding the mysterious origins and evolution of sex. Um, it was not comprehensively appreciated until Hunter's transformational birds led him to delineate a new scientific epithet. Uh, through the century, 
following Hunter's um, uh, authoritative interest in the subject, numerous naturalists and physicians made, made further descriptions of sex transformative birds in leading world works of natural history and medical science. Um, often accompanied, as my slide shows here, um, with some beautiful drawings. Avian species in which sex changes were documented through the 19th century include peafowl, turkey, partridge, pigeon, bustard, duck, cuckoo, katinga, um, a chaffinch, red starts, starling, sparrowhawk, wood grouse, bunting, and kingfisher. The English naturalist William Yarrell broached the subject in 1827. Yarrell insisted that the occasional development of male typical characteristics was not restricted to aged female birds, but could be produced by, as I quote, certain constitutional circumstances, essentially impairment of the ovaries, which could occur at any period of, um, of life or induced by artificial means. Extended to other species, including humans, Yarrell's savvy proto-endocrinology paved the way for a new era of sex physiology to emerge with far-reaching um, consequences. Well, the pioneering investigations of, of Hunter and Yarrell and many other naturalists um, impressed the minds of a new generation um, of biologists, not least the young beagle fresh Charles Darwin. Along with other natural sex variant phenomena, such as uh, neuter bees and, and the occasional occurrence of, of horns in, in, in female deer that don't normally have them, avian sex reversal helped persuade Darwin that all higher animals, including humans, were essentially hermaphrodite, i.e. intersexed. The idea was, was not new to Darwin, um, but before his authoritative acceptance of the principle, um, it had not received widespread um, support. But Darwin was an early convert to the theory. Remarks in his early notebooks, compared to the late 1830s, evidence the profound impact of Yarrell's observations, as well as other related studies, on Darwin's developing biological thought. Um, I'll, I'll read just that one, because he starts talking about instincts as well. He's extending this idea of hermaphroditic um, anatomy uh, to, to the mind. A capon will sit upon eggs, he wrote, as well as, and often better than a female. This is full of interest, for it shows latent instincts, even in brain of male. Every animal surely is hermaphrodite, as seen in plumage of hybrid birds. In another pertinent entry among several um, in his notebooks, Darwin asserted that every man and woman is hermaphrodite. Well, the perennial coexistence of female and male elements in each individual um, remained an important component of Darwin's evolutionism on a number of fronts. It was, for example, vital to his theory of heredity. In his book, uh, 1868, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, he, discuss he discussed sex transformations in a section titled Latent Characters. He wrote, but I must explain what is meant by characters lying latent. The most obvious illustration is afforded by secondary sexual characters. In every female, all the secondary male characters, and in every male, all the secondary female characters apparently exist in a latent state, ready to be evolved under certain conditions. Supporting this momentous assertion, Darwin explicitly referred to the literature on female birds assuming male plumage, particularly when old or diseased or when operated on. He drew heavily on these, those naturalists who had investigated the subject, um, including Yarrell. Um, something very interesting happens with Darwin because he also um, remarks very interestingly that Aristotle was well aware of the changes in mental disposition in old hens. And it was one of the, the rare instances that he referred, albeit obliquely, to same-sex sexual behaviour. And this is a pattern um, in, in other naturalists' work of the, of the era that they start looking at the classical authors um, a, as a means of raising the subject of same-sex sexual behaviours. Um, elsewhere, uh, Darwin, for example, used terms like unnatural crimes, evil habits, vitiated instincts, utter licentiousness, um, terms that had, had, had were absorbed by his generation um, that had largely been derived from, from the uh, the notion of non-occurrence. So there is some bitter irony um, in, in Darwin's uh, reference to Aristotle, that um, at this time, the classical corpus suddenly becomes useful for um, 
naturalists to discuss same-sex sexual behaviours, um, and yet they do so in draconian terms that have been largely derived um, from, from um, uh, medieval natural law and theology. Um, in the article that I've written for the, um, the Zoological Journal, I, I, I talk more than I'm going to today about the impact of, of, of Darwin and, and his um, uh, endorsement of the, of the theory of primordial intersexuality. Um, it really is uh, surprising the degree, even as his theory of sexual selection had a very, very bumpy um, uh, reception among other biologists. This idea of dual sex origins um, enjoyed enormous popularity and was um, used in, in numerous scientific um, and other contexts. Um, again, I'm going to jump because I want to move into the 20th century. Um, but before I do, just this idea of uh, sex changing animals um, and, and intersex animals. Um, the early 20th century, which was the subject of my doctoral research, um, I found something out that was, that was surprising and is, is still um, so little appreciated, which, although I've been talking about um, uh, elite scientific texts, it also becomes hugely popular. Um, most of these examples, and, and this is just a very small selection of what I've collected um, of, of newspaper articles, um, either reporting occurrences of, of um, non-human animals uh, that have been derived from, say, farmers or, or agriculturists, um, and also, increasingly, scientific studies of those animals. It really did form a very interesting, um, very rich, very prolific um, trope in early 20th century uh, popular natural history narratives. And it's something that was almost completely lost. Um, certainly, uh, David Attenborough's programmes, which I've been watching all my life. Uh, I, I don't remember an age before Attenborough, but there was one, um, and it was, it was an awful lot queerer um, than kind of post-1945 popular history narratives. And a lot of my research on this looks at, at what happened um, to, the, to this early, um, but very much queerer narratives about animal bodies and uh, a general acceptance that uh, certain sex characteristics were mutable. Um, but let's get back to this question of same-sex sexual behaviours. Now, here we go, Mark. I, I, I'm not letting you down. We've got the cop chafers. Um, same-sex sexual behaviours in, in non-human animals did not enjoy the same level of popularity as narratives around intersexualities and transformations of sex. It remained a very heavily um, uh, uh, sensitive subject and um, causing some, some, I mean, historically interesting, but often uh, uh, quite troubling narratives. Um, the subject, after centuries of, of neglect, the, we, we do get a few, um, a, a couple of examples in, in the 18th century of, of naturalists referring to same-sex sexual behaviours, particularly in birds. Um, but really, it's with um, entomology and, and beetles, cockchafers. chafers. Um, from 1834, um, entomologists across Europe began reporting same-sex copulatory activity in actually a variety of insect species, um, but most of the, most of the, the um, discourse focuses on, on, on cockchafers. Initial communications of same-sex couplings were mainly accompanied by exclamations of surprise and the rhetoric of disapproval. Such activity was explained either by the assumption that one of the parties must in some way have a female or intersex anatomy, or that blind or excessive lust compelled more virile individuals to force copulation upon weaker ones. As these explanations were questioned, more complex and controversial theories founded in fashionable evolutionary theories were forwarded as means of assimilating the phenomenon within hegemonic constructions of sexuality. These came both from within entomological circles and from outside observers whose primary interest was in theorizing human sexuality. And that's something that, that continues right through the 20th century. Um, a particularly intense dispute erupted following the claim by one of France's leading naturalists, which he made in 1895, Henri Cadot de Kerville was his name, that the, um, uh, the same-sex sexual activity um, demonstrated um, by male um, beetles evidenced the existence of a distinctly homosexual, his word, instinct. Um, 
turning into the 20th century, I mean, uh, Kerber really did get it in the neck for his, um, his um, claims about uh, the, the male beetles. Other naturalists really went through extreme um, ethical, personal and professional um, agonies um, when faced with behaviours in their, in, their, in their zoological subjects um, that in humans were heavily prescribed. Um, this is so true, I and mean, people might be familiar um, because um, this story actually hit the headlines not so long ago. Um, a prolific amateur naturalist, um, uh, Levick, his name was, um, um, he was surgeon, officer, and zoo zoologist um, above uh, aboard Robin, Robert Falcon Scott's ill-fated British Antarctic, the Terra Nova expedition of 1910 to 1913. He was uniquely placed to observe the natural behaviour of the Adelie penguins, which inhabit the regions of Victoria Land that he visited in 1911, especially the Adelie penguin rookery at Cape Adair, which is now recognised as the largest such colony in the world. His two unpublished notebooks containing his original observations at Cape Adair um, feature some of the most extensive zoological descriptions of non-reproductive sexual behaviours by a modern British naturalist. They record observations of frequent copulatory activity between breeding pairs after eggs have been laid, as well as uh, autoeroticism, masturbation, necrophilia, sexual coercion, physical and sexual abuse of chicks, and male homosexual sex. There seems to be no crime too low for these penguins, he wrote. Um, he described how these behaviours often related to groups of unpaired males, which Levick termed hooligans. Uh, which patrolled the peripheries of the colony. Strikingly, um, Levick plainly doctored his original text, pasting over certain sections with the text rewritten in Greek. His unpublished, privately circulated paper on the sexual habits of the birds was initially intended for publication as, as part of his book, Natural History of the Adeli Penguin, um, but it was taken out, uh, most likely um, due to, to um, challenging and, and, and graphic content. A letter dated 6th of February 1915 by Sidney Frederick Harmer, who was the keeper of zoology at the Natural History Museum in Tring, uh, to the keeper of birds, William Robert Ogilvy Grant. These men apparently playing a role in the preparation of Levick's observations for publication. Harmer wrote, sexual habits, we will have to cut this out and some copies printed for our own use. The agreed print run of the pamphlet was agreed at 100 and were duly um, produced with a bold heading, not for publication. And it was the, the rediscovery of, the, of this pamphlet um, in, in an archive at the Tring Museum that, that prompted uh, the, these headlines, um, which give a great <laughs> sensationalized descriptions of their content. It would, however, be wrong. Um, to think that, that Levick's tortured um, anxieties over reporting um, uh, uh, variations of sex um, were ubiquitously shared. They were certainly experienced by others. I want to set against Levick another early 20th century naturalist, Edmund Selu, who was a prolific amateur naturalist um, who published innovative field studies as well as uh, popular works for adults and children. He instigated a, a new standard of ornithology, which was enormously influential on a new generation of naturalists. He championed sustained observation in natural habitats and deplored the practice of killing animals, which is an especially interesting situation uh, because his, his brother, Frederick Sello, was a renowned big game hunter. Uh, the younger uh, uh, Edmund Sello, he made lengthy and comprehensive diary notes on the birds and other animals he observed often accompanied with commentaries about his own thoughts, practices, and experiences, as well as lively denunciations of prevailing practices of his fellow ornithologists. He prided himself on recording everything he saw and was more willing than any British naturalist before him to look beyond the lingering conventions of Victorian morality if his observations demanded it. So I've just pulled this the delightful quote, which I think really does summarize his, his approach, um, much more forthcoming than Levick. Salute wrote in 1906, 
The following observations were made in a part of Holland by no means difficult of access and which can be approached by any of the ordinary routes. My object in making them was to get some first-hand evidence in regard to sexual selection, but though for the most part they come under the title which I have given to this paper, I have not wished to hamper myself by a too close limitation to the main subject of inquiry, or to exclude what might have only an indirect bearing upon it. With respect to the rough in particular, I have described all I saw, and should anyone think that I had better left out certain things which I saw, I can only say, frankly, that I am not of that opinion, and that it is not my habit to do so. Well, what were those roughs up to? Well, <laughs> appearing in this, in this presentation, you, you can probably guess, um, Sello actually described same-sex pairings um, on several occasions in, in, in some uh, 1906 article on the breeding habits of the rough. Uh, so, for example, watching a group of, of, of the male roughs on, on the morning of the 20th of April, 1906. Very interestingly, again, this is the, this, this, this idea of the, of the rhetoric that's being used. He referred to the perverted sexuality and sexual perversion in relation to same-sex coition in the birds he was watching. Well, as I've previously indicated, such rhetoric was by no means unusual for the period elsewhere in scientific and medical writing. And it's very interesting, um, Bruce Bagamil in his book, his 1999 book, which I, I pictured earlier, Biological Exuberance. Um, Sello is one of the, the naturalists that Bruce Bagamil um, uh, highlights and, and, and takes the task for, 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 for this, this very heavily ideologically loaded rhetoric, perverted sexuality. Um, and uh, Bagamil very, very uh, skillfully scrutinizes the use of such uh, anthropomorphized rhetoric in zoological discourse. But interestingly, though, Sello himself acknowledged that the rhetoric of perversion, which he called a term which serves to save one the trouble of thinking, was problematic. And his subsequent commentary on avian same sex sexual behaviors, he abandoned it. So, for example, in the diary entry dated 25th of April, uh, Sello described a busy scene where around a dozen parents between roughs and reeves, a female, female roughs, um, 10 of these um, uh, with the same favoured male bird had taken place. Other elements, he wrote, of a less straightforward nature, such as I have before touched on, have not been wanting during these scenes. There have been, for instance, at least three male unisexual coitions. He coins this term, unisexual coitions whilst one rough is at this moment assiduously courting another. My impression, however, is that these false rights, still a very heavily loaded term there, have been performed more often. Well, his remarks on unisexual coition in roughs um, constitute some of the most thorough that have hitherto been published in British natural history writing. I'm mindful of time. Um, I think maybe we, we must come back again and, and talk more about uh, the 20th century because these um, uh, certainly uh, zoological narratives about all manner of sex variation has become much more prolific. Um, and what takes over from a narrative of, of non-occurrence um, is something else um, which we might call a, a kind of um, uh, uh, an epistemological paradigm of explanation, trying to explain or more readily explain away and particularly same-sex sexual behaviours, invariably termed um, homosexuality through, through the 20th century. Um, there's, there's lots of that. It's, it's, it's um, a literature that I'm, I'm still getting to grips with, particularly towards the end of the 20th century. Um, but I just want to stress that there are other ways of looking at the history of zoology, um, especially um, one might consider, for example, the, the, the private lives or, or, or the, um, the sexualities of zoologists. Does it matter? Uh, well, the answer to that varies enormously according to, to different uh, uh, localities and different individuals. I just want to highlight one example. I think this is a story that um, when one thinks globally about the history of zoology, um, there will be many other examples. For when an, an individual zoologist's sexuality um, mattered a lot, at least to other people. Um, so I'm talking about Harold Lee Sharp, um, who was um, a noted copper pathologist and a biology teacher. Um, in 
July 1931, Lee Sharp resigned his lectureship at Chelsea Polytechnic um, in circumstances about which little is known, uh, but which were seemingly related to his homosexuality. It was in July 1935, however, that his professional career was ruined um, after he was convicted for importuning at West London Police Court. Helped by his committed friend, the eminent naturalist Miriam Rothschild, who paid for a leading barrister to defend him, uh, Lee Sharp was spared prison. He was, he was fined. And the event might have passed with less damage had a journalist not been present in the courtroom on the off chance that a case might prove newsworthy. Well, thus alerted, the News of the World um, on the 21st of July 1935, along with several London newspapers, I've just included one example here, um, reportedly Sharp's case. Um, he subsequently resigned his position as teacher of biology at St Mary's um, Hospital Medical School, now part of the Imperial College um, School of Medicine, a position he had held successfully since 1919. Um, he continued to publish a, a small number of papers on, on, on the biology of copper pods uh, through the late 1930s, but his, his career was ruined. So I think it's important to add that dimension um, because as I say, I think um, the more we look, the more we will find stories um, of a similar nature. Um, and of course it's important to recognize them because um, issues certainly around law um, and neurology being a subject that, that is global in scope. Um, many LGBTQ plus scientists, naturalists today encounter all manner of, 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 of problems. Um, which is why we need campaigning organisations like Pride in STEM and others, and, and to keep up the momentum of, of visibility and representation um, in the biological sciences. Um, I am drawing to a close. I'm not quite sure how, how I'm doing for time. Um, I've, I've lost my clock. Um, but I've, I've just got a couple more slides, so I, I will bash through them. Um, just to bring things up to what we might call the sexual revolution in, 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 in the post-war era, um, again, thinking bigger, there, there's, there's such um, big cultural um, uh, uh, dynamics that, that, that often get this umbrella term sexual revolution um, for, for the 1960s and, and 70s. And the, the biological sciences uh, were by no means unaffected. Uh, absolutely um, um, an extraordinary time of change. Um, still a lot of kind of quite heavy draconian narratives about the variations of sex, um, but also pioneering. Um, naturalists actively seeking change um, and chief among these really that the heroine of, of this whole story is, is Anne in the stag um, um, who really instigated a pivotal moment of change signaling the beginning of a new progressive approach to sexological zoology. Um, a Canadian naturalist um, who, who's an expert, the, the, one of the leading, leading experts on, on giraffe um, definitely demonstrating that same-sex sexual behaviours in the natural world um, are by no means unusual, um, or especially latent, if one thinks of, of Darwin's comments on the matter. Early in her career, Dag not only observed homosexual behaviour in wild male giraffe, I'm using her terminology here, in the Cassery Valley in South Africa, but saw that it occurred more commonly than mating behaviour, which she actually only ever observed once. Um, and the, 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 um, the same sex sexual behaviours uh, between the males even happened in the presence of females. But at the time, the young Dag uh, was too embarrassed to talk about it with her associates, um, but described her observations candidly and without the rhetoric of disapproval in a seminal 1958 paper published in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London. Later in her career, Dag penned the first major review article of published reports describing same-sex sexual behaviour, as well as occurrences of female-male mounting, what might sometimes get called reverse mounting, and she did this in 125 species. Dag was prompted to do so um, after talking with lesbian students at the University of Waterloo and learning about their experience of being irrationally derided as, that word, unnatural and other homophobic abuses. Her uh, pioneering review article was published in Mammal Review in 1984. Um, and there, there's just no better account of this than, than her own, which um, appears um, in her 2016 book, Smitten by Giraffe, 
really well worth seeking this out. Um, a testament um, really to, to the to how, how the, the profound cultural changes of, of the post-war era impacted on the production of, 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 of this science. Just to finish, I, I just wanted to mention, I'm absolutely delighted that, um, uh, that Mark was introducing me. Thank you so much, Mark. I, re I really appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to mention queer botany, which a number of, of um, uh, historians have, have written about. Um, botanists have all the fun, they really do. I mean, the history of botany is, 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 is absolutely, it's, it's so rude. Um, there's a wonderful book, Sex, Botany and Empire by, by a fabulous uh, historian of science, Patricia Farrer, well worth reading. And um, the, the naughtiness of botanists, um, it kind of begins with Joseph Banks in the 18th century, who, who in the pursuit of botany lost his trousers in, in, in very embarrassing circumstances. Um, but historians are now thinking more queerly. It, it's um, a, a, a very um, innovative paper published in 2010 by the, the science historian Lewis Campos. I put the reference to it here um, on, on mutant sexuality. Um, the mutant really applies to the, the plants that these, um, these a whole, whole bunch of botanists, queer botanists, um, primroses that they, they tended to study. And Campos makes a very, very interesting argument. Again, it's about this private life of the scientist. Does it matter? And he says, yes, it does. And that their science, their interest in, in the, the um, uh, sexual lives of, of, of primroses, one queer plant, says Campos, and he says that reflected their own lives. Um, there's certainly more to do uh, in terms of their history, um, not just of queer botany, um, but queer histories of, of zoology and uh, science more generally. Um, so I will finish there. Um, thank you again um, to, to Padma, um, to, to Mark and, and, and Martin for the opportunities um, to help bring this, um, hopefully, uh, give some indication that the, the, of the depth and breadth of, of this um, queer history. Yes, it's sometimes troubling, um, but it is, as I hope I've, I've um, underscored, um, very important in terms of much broader currents that stem beyond specialist zoological texts uh, to really major developments and movements in the, in the history of, of um, theology and the history of science and in uh, popular culture through the centuries more generally. Thank you. Mark, do you want to take over now? Thank you very much, Padma. Thank you very much, Ross, for that. Um, entertaining talk um it's funny when you listen to uh, a talk like this it triggers memories and emotions of many aspects of in my case my own life of you know seeing queer identities as a young child in the countryside you know uh uh same-sex attracted Pekingese that my mother had <laughs> there was, uh, who was very very fond of other female Pekingeses and uh, um thruples of ducks with um, two uh, male ducks who were very, very fond of each other and with a female duck who was uh, closely by their side, but very much by their side. Um, and I was also very glad and interested to hear your comments about queerness and queer identity right at the beginning, because uh, like you, I'm at uh, the sort of uh, the, the older age of the sort of queer community spectrum. And remember very, very clearly when the language of queerness was extremely potent within our community. And I personally was involved in um, activism in the 80s and early 90s and even experienced somebody threatening to burn themselves to death. This was a fellow activist because they were so traumatized by this language. Um, so language is incredibly potent and powerful within our community. So um, thank you very, very much for the talk. I'm, I'm glad I got a little bit of cock chaffer action and, so, and the penguins <laughs> in there as well. Okay. Um, we have a, two or three questions. Oh, um, <laughs> the first one I'm going to, I'm actually rather equivocal about this question. Uh, and somebody's asked a question which I've heard asked very often in public about us, using um, anthrocentric, human-centric language whilst describing um, the sexualities 
um, and the activities of other organisms. Now, um, I personally feel this is deeply problematic because we use human language to describe the natural world at all times. And I think it's um, quite concerning that at times people find it exceptional that we should use human language to describe um, other organisms when it comes to queerness, because we don't have these debates, for example, whilst discussing heteronormative behavior in, in animals, or we don't have these debates whilst discussing um, aspects of the physiology or whatever it may be. So I'm a somewhat um, concerned about the nature of that question because I think it frankly brings forth, I think for me personally, some somewhat homophobic strands. Um, I do apologize, the person who put that question there, I may be at the extreme end of perspective on this, but I think we need to be really, really robust as a community in challenging the importance of us being able to talk about these things and choosing the language we use to talk about our identities and how we see them in the natural world. We are not different and we are not other. Um, so I've made that little statement. Now, Ross, would you like to say anything yes. further to what I've just said on that point? I, I, I'm certainly with you. And, and, and in a sense, you, you, you've articulated an answer to the question much, much better than I, I probably would. Um, but yes, it's something I, I, this is, I think, my 13th year looking into these subjects. And it is, is never failing. It happens to me personally. It happens mm -hmm. around my publications. The degree to which any reference to uh, intersexualities, sex variants, sex transformations, non-reproductive sexual behavior, uh, behaviors prompts such different questions and is treated so differently and prompts different re rhetoric to the way in which opposite sex um, relations. Um, it's something um, I, have, I have lots of discussions about. Um, I actually think it's getting better. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, coming back to the, 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 these, the changes that are happening now and that have happened in, in recent years. Um, I think I made the point when I when I put all, all my fun stuff up, all, all, the, all the pictures of the pin badges and, and, and what have you, um, and there's children's books showing animal same-sex couples. And it's really important to understand there is nothing there that has not been already firmly established over decades and over centuries um, that um, did not all previously exist for perpetuating um, social, gender, and sexual norms. You know, children's books showing mummy and daddy, fluffy penguins. But they go back. Edmund Sello is an example in his children's books. You, you have, you know, mummy bear, daddy bear, and, and little baby bear. You know, representations of, of gender and sexual norms um, through animals have, have permeated our culture. And I, I previously um, spoke about David Attenborough's uh, natural history program so ubiquitous um, they, are, they are framed in very particular ways to represent um, the, the perceived values of, of a very particular middle class audience. Absolutely. And one, I'm, also, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to give another example in natural history museums when you see these dioramas of birds in a nest there's always mummy daddy and little, little fluff ball um, you know that, that it's been put there you know it is a narrative that, that has been shaped to order. But I, I, um, I have a Go on. sorry. I have I have another a specific question here from somebody who's asking: um, Do um, same-sex animal couples seem to have lifelong relationships uh, as well as temporary? Um, now, I suspect um, certainly from my personal experience, my mother's same-sex attracted Pekingese was ardently interested in my mother's um, Welsh Border Collie, although it wasn't reciprocated throughout the whole of her life. So that's my personal experience. And I'd like to give some general comments around that idea. Now, what did I say? I said I'm not a zoologist. I, I thought you were going to say that. Yeah. I mean, I, yes. I, think, the, yes. Yeah. I know I, certain, certain swans do. My, my picture that I finished on here, um, certainly swans are going to bond for life. But there are 
I mean, an increasing number of people, of zoologists and science writers who have expertise on this now. And certainly um, Josh Luke Davis, who's, who's one of the brilliant science writers at the National History Museum, now he's pioneered, I think I put a link up, I hope everyone got that, um, for this kind of um, interactive virtual tour that you, you can take, a, an LGBTQ plus themed tour of, of the Natural History Museum. And actually, I think he, he enters into this question. So, and he's much better qualified um, to, to talk about that. And, and others are as well. Um, uh, Alex Bond, who's the, the curator of birds at the, the Tree Museum, again, he has expert, the zoological expertise. Um, so yes, I, I think I can offer a general kind of yes to the question. Yes, they do. Um, certain bird species do. Um, yeah. And there are others. Um, yeah. Seek out these people, seek out their work, seek out these amazing queer initiatives that are happening in museums, because they, they, that's exactly the kind of question that, that, that they're approaching, that uh, uh, highlighting, yeah. providing answers to. And that those books you just um, presented earlier on, the, the modern books looking at queer identities and sexuality mm -hmm. um, are probably full of lots of useful information relating yes. to, um, to those aspects mm -hmm. of the world. I was going to just momentarily, as you know, this has been largely about zoology, but it's fair to say, um, as Ross indicated, that botany is full of queerness and diversity, not only in terms of those who, of us who study and admire plants, but also actually in the plants themselves. Um, we have plants with um, most distinct and persistent um, asexuality within them. We have plants that have the capacity to change gender. We have plants with uneven, unequal genetic inheritance, such as roses. So, and plants are full of all sorts of fascinating and unusual aspects in their strategies for staying alive on this planet. Um, somebody actually asked a question about George O'Keefe and representations of plants in queerness. Um, that's probably a little bit off piste most definitely for me. Um, I do believe people have written about um, this, this topic, but it's not something I know anything about. Ross? Um, I'm afraid I can't for kind of 20, 20th, 21st centuries. I mean, just, I really am being, the, being um, the archaic historian here. But actually, the answer to that question yeah. goes right back in terms of the, the use of queer plants, if I, if I can venture that, that term, um, in, in literature and arts uh, really has a long history. And I'm particularly thinking of 18th century pornography, which was, you know, it wasn't really... Yeah. It wasn't written graphically, you couldn't say what humans were doing. But it was often written euphemistically using the parts of plants. Um, and so you get this amazing kind of creative artistic representation of, of plant sex. And this begins to take on actually a much more um, uh, interesting social and political um, um, aspect during the 19th century, when uh, certainly someone like Karl Heinrich Auerich, who's, who's one of the, the, the pioneering gay rights campaigners, if you read his books, he actually talks about plants as well, saying that, you know, male and female as principles um, are not found um, in, in very much in nature. And he would talk about plants and, and, and um, how, how male plants can uh, be attracted to other male plants. Um, but yes, I must say, once, once, uh, um, we, we get into the, 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 the 20th century, um, uh, history, history is keeping busy enough, but history of art is, is uh, again, yeah, perhaps off my, my radar as well. I'm going to leap back into the 18th century momentarily, because it's partly because what you were saying triggered something in my memory banks, and it's also reflected by a comment that somebody's made regarding Linnaeus. Um, and Linnaeus and his community of fellow scientists in the early 18th century um, faced an enormous backlash um, when they presented ideas of sexuality in plants. Linnaeus wasn't the very first person to do it, um, but I think it was Valon off the top of my head. I can't quite remember now. But the idea that plants were sexy was very, very traumatizing to many of the um, the um, 18th century scientific community, so much so that um, Sigursbeck, who was a ultimately not exactly Linnaeus's best friend, 
wrote of the loathsome harlotry, this idea of uh, 10 men in bed with one woman um, in a single flower head. They were so horrified by the notion of plant sexuality. So there's probably quite a lot more to be done within the botanical histories about exploring some of these. Mm. I have got another question here, which I'm going to read out to you verbatim. So please bear with me a moment because I'm rubbish at this. Um, have you found evidence about queer natural history. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mark, could you start again? You, you, you went, ah. your recording went a bit funny. Just broken up. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, this. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Lee, can you still not hear me? My signal's not good. Am I back again? Yes, you are. Ah. Can you hear me again now, Ross? Yes, I can. Have you got me now? Yes. My signal's not very good. Could you possibly read the... Um, um, Ross, I've put the it in the box. chat. Um, I'll just read it out. Have you found evidence... Thank from, you. Thank you. Have you found evidence from the pre-war era when people were talking more about queer natural histories that academics and the public were also talking about what is considered natural, in quotes, human sexual behavior? Or was it restricted to non-human fascination? I, I'm, I'm gobsmacked by that question. That's pretty much the question that I, I broached as, as, as my doctoral thesis. It's, it's a, such an interesting question, such an interesting period. Um, yes, and I said, yeah, very, very often what's considered natural um, human and non-human behavior in, a, in the Darwinian paradigm, um, the discourses that are inextricably Connected. I mean, just um, today, I guess I've, I've perhaps given a, a, a slightly um, um, uh, twist perspective, um, although I think I have mentioned that, that uh, many of the naturalists I discussed, you know, they use their observations of, of non-human animals to make declarations about human um, sexual, um, what, what's natural and what's unnatural. Um, there is something in this mix which is really important. Um, actually, most of the biologists I look at for the, for the early 20th century, um, they readily accept that the vari vari variations of sex um, have evolved through millions of years of, of, of evolution. It, it's quite extraordinary. They don't actually tend to use um, words like unnatural. Others do using their works, but the biologists themselves, they, they actually, in, in, in lots of different ways, um, accept that even homosexuality um, has a, a biological, um, uh, evolutionary, and, and um, individual development, is founded in individual development. But what we have to factor in for the early 20th century, that, that their deliberations are also inextricably um, connected to, to uh, the eugenics of the era, which is developing at the time as well. So the assertion that um, intersexuality is transformations of sex or same-sex sexual behaviours in humans was natural, actually was treated very, very differently um, to how we might um, view that um, ethically today. And the view of many naturalists, like I can name you lots, but Julian Huxley, a very famous um, uh, a biologist in the era before Attenborough, um, viewed, um, he had a very deterministic view of, of homosexuality, um, but for him it was a means of trying to develop means of eradicating it. So you can see this gets very complex, and of course there's a lot about um, the, the, the early history of, of Mendelism and, and, and genetics gets tied up. With all this stuff, um, particularly somebody like Huxley, I mean, it, it's, it, it's such a mix of, of eugenics, of observations, field observations of animal behavior, as well as laboratory studies of, of highly manipulated experiments when rodents and, and um, other animals are, are, are kind of manipulated in, in, into particular sexual behaviors. Um, so, yes, you, you can see I'm talking too much. It's because I wrote 100,000 words exactly on this. Topic, um, <laughs> I very much hope in the fullness of time to turn that into, into a book. Um, I'm trying to spare you the full force of the 100,000 words at the moment, uh, but it is a, a really important era, and I'll, I'll finish with this, for establishing tropes that we still live with. 
um, uh, narratives about human behavior, sexual behavior, um, and non-human um, uh, uh, zoological studies of, of, of sex variations. And I'm particularly thinking of popular narratives, um, the, the way in which um, natural history programs and, and coming back to museums as well. This is the era, this is the era when um, uh, a lot of their um, uh, practices were established. So thank you for that question. It's a fantastic question. So we, well, I have one more in the, um, in the, can you hear me now? Am I back? Yes, yes you are. Sorry about that signal here is terrible. Um, this may relate to part of your um, lecture earlier on. I, I've got, I kind of slightly missed this. There's a question say, Banks and his trousers, question mark. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question relates to. I don't, unless the possibly yeah, the I, person who could put it in could expand on it a little bit. No, well, I, I think I mentioned it. Um, yes, I think it should be Patricia Farrow's book on Joseph Banks, Sex, Botany and Empire. Um, oh, yeah. that was it. Yes. yes, absolutely. It's all in there. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's a bit of a stereotype that the kind of the, 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 the 18th century being the, being the kind of the naughty century, but there, there were there were naughty people. I actually saw in the chat somebody mentioned Erasmus Darwin as well. Um, Charles Darwin. Most famous grandpa, um, another you know such an interesting character who, who used coming back to this um, notion of, 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 of plants and, and this very um, disturbing um, discovery of plant sex. And he he wrote poetry. He wrote uh, serious scientific tracts um, uh, using you know analogies to, to plants. Um, but yeah, Patricia Farrow's book. If, if, if you want Banks's trousers. Um, yes, Londa Schiebinger. Thank you, Ted, who's just put a, um, uh, uh, yeah. a book, uh, Nature's Body. Nature's Body is a book by Londa Schiebinger, um, who looks at the, these issues. I think she talks about the private life of plants. It's, it's um, you know, really great scholarship on, on uh, uh, the science of sex and, and how it gets used in, in multiple contexts through the 18th century. So um, I believe we may be near the end. I think we've we've run out of questions um, and possibly Astine, thank you very much for a delightful and fascinating talk. Um, and I'd also like to thank everybody who joined this evening. Um, please do come and visit the Linnaean Society, whether it be online or in person as life becomes maybe hopefully easier um, as we continue to live through this pandemic. Please look at our website and look at our talks and uh, our other other public facing offerings. Um, and if you have any further questions, do contact either myself or the Linnaean Society and we can have a chat. Um, Padma, do you need to say anything else? I would say one more time. Thank you very much, Ross. That was delightful. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Padma. Thank you to everyone. Wonderful <laughs> questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.